Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything D&D, including advice for players and guides for GMs. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Today, we're discussing how to homebrew new subclasses for D&D 5e. And this is a very apropos topic in light of the fact that Kelly and I have just recently launched our second Kickstarter project, which features several new subclasses designed by us. Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim is coming off the tails of our first Kickstarter. We started working on this one right away when we heard everybody saying, we want subclasses, we want new player options, and we want more lore. So we're going to be delivering that in the source book Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim. We're putting this project together in partnership with Ghostfire Gaming, who have sponsored this week's episode. As part of this project, we have created one new subclass for every core class in 5th edition, and we've also created subclasses for our new class, the Apothecary. And previously, we've also worked with Ghostfire Gaming on their Grim Hollow Player's Guide, where we wrote several subclasses for them as well. We've had a lot of fun creating these subclasses for our book, which are inspired on the history and lore of our world, fueled with contaminated magic and eldritch horror, but they are usable in any campaign setting. We've created some subclasses like the Malfeasant Wizard who can wield contaminated magic against their foes, or the Path of the Old Gods Barbarian who can use just about anything they get their hands on as a weapon. That includes their enemies, so if you've ever wanted to play a barbarian who uses a goblin as a club against the other goblins, or even can wield a dragon as a improvised weapon at high levels of play, you should check out our subclasses. <laughs> that and so much more are going to be brought to your games in Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim, and we hope that you're as excited as we are to unleash these new subclasses on the battlefield. The campaign is live now until mid-September, so check the links in the description below to get on it, and all the cool accessories and other goodies that we've created for this book while well, uh, well, you still can. And with that, let's start talking about homebrewing subclasses. Seeing as we now have a little bit of experience yeah. in this category, I'm excited to dive into sort of break down how we have designed subclasses and hopefully give you some tips and tricks so that you can design your own subclasses in your game. We're going to be sharing what our method is. There's a lot of different ways to create subclasses for D&D 5e. There's a lot of different methodologies that you can employ, but this is just the way that we do it and it's worked for us working as a team together to build our classes. And I think that that's one of the interesting things about our process in, in particular because we do work as a team on our subclasses. And for us, that's why one of the biggest things that we start with when we are designing subclasses for D&D 5e is talking about the fantasy we want to capture. I think that that's step one, is you got to figure out your fantasy. Yeah. You don't go in with the mechanics. The first question is, what is the fantasy of the subclass? What makes it different from the other subclasses available to that class? If you're creating a fighter subclass or a paladin subclass, the first question is, what is this going to feel like in play? Usually we start by writing down a bunch of point form notes that might have an ability suggestion, but not even fully detailed. So for example, when you're coming up with your fantasy in the Grim Hollow Player's Guide, we created the Highway Rider Rogue. We had been playing a lot of Red Dead Redemption, so we wanted to make a rogue who felt like that desperado bandit riding along the roads, stealing all the goods from the caravans, and then riding off into the sunset. Yeah, and so one of the things that we find really helpful when developing a subclass is to think about the archetypes that you want to capture. Write down characters from books, movies, video games, television shows, that if you were building that character, this subclass that you're developing would be the perfect class to describe them. You can get as specialized or as general as you want with this. And one of the things that I do want to say about this stage of the creative process is so many times when you're talking about subclasses, you're going to hear immediately someone say, but that's stepping on the toes of this class or that subclass. Don't worry about that at this stage. That is not a thing that should even be on your mind when you are ideating what you want to create. Don't worry about figuring out the reasons of why you need to justify why it's unique. Right now you want to articulate what is the fantasy you're trying to capture, what makes this exciting, what makes that a cool character idea. Then you can start thinking about what are the mechanics that might reflect that. And in some cases when you're designing a subclass, you might approach it from another perspective where you are like, 
I have a really cool idea for a mechanic. Like, I really wish that there was a fighter class that was more about being a battlefield leader. Or I really wish that there was a paladin who was really inspired by taking an oath to a witch or a fairy creature. Or I really like the idea that rogues are inspired by Han Solo, but I want to double and triple down on the idea of being a smuggler. At this stage, don't worry too much about whether or not you're stepping on the toes of other options out there. There's no bad ideas in brainstorming. Don't shut down your own ideas at this stage. Not to mention that if you look around at the many subclasses that have been formed, a lot of them do borrow ideas from other subclasses that already exist. So that's not a problem that you need to worry about yet. Yeah, I mean, the Hexblade Warlock and the Bladesinger are definitely stepping on the toes of the fighter, but they're still really cool ideas because they blend two different ideas. So just because a character or an idea that you have can do something similar to an existing character archetype, that's not justification to not make a new subclass at this stage of the game. It really needs to be about what the fantasy is, what's new about that fantasy, what's new about that idea, what's new about that concept, and how you can better realize it. Many people will argue that with reflavoring and changing things around that you can build any character concept that exists in fantasy out there. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. I think that there still are some things that need more mechanical support to be realized in D&D 5e. But when we're trying to be creative and come up with new ideas, we shouldn't hold those ideas as limitations, especially early in the process. That can come later. When you are looking at the mechanics of designing a subclass, they are part of the story of that subclass. So reflavoring can only get you so far, but you want the mechanics that you are designing to help tell the story of the fantasy. There's, there's certain parts of D&D that feel better when they work a certain way. Swinging a big sword should have you roll more damage die, whereas two-handed weapons should have you make multiple attack rolls. These are sort of to help fulfill the fantasy of what it's like to do these things. So when you're thinking of the fantasy, this is going to lend itself into the mechanical aspects that you're going to design. If you have a character that uses psionic powers and teleports around the battlefield, what does that feel like mechanically to help amplify that sense that you want on the battlefield. I find it's helpful to write one to three paragraphs narratively describing what the subclass is all about. After all, every subclass comes with a little bit of lore about it anyways, and starting with the lore means that once you get into the weeds of the mechanics, you can go back to the lore that you've written and be like, okay, has what I created, does it really reflect the lore? And come back to that for more ideas. Turning back to that time and time again will really, really help you, especially if you get into a creative block later in the process. Now, as we come to designing the mechanics for our subclass, luckily D&D 5e gives us some little templates that we can actually use. If you look at most of the subclasses, they follow a pretty basic structure. Within each class, that structure might change. Now, this rule applies to every single class in the game. As you're looking through the class, you're going to see the same examples used in almost every subclass for that class. But for the simplicity of this video, we want to break down just one class and use that as our template that we're going to use. So why don't we take a look at the Paladin, who has one of the most clear and obvious templates to follow. If you look at the Paladin table in the Player's Handbook, you'll actually see that they have a Sacred Oath feature listed several times during their table. Paladins gain these features when they take the subclass at third level, and then again, they get another feature at level 7, another feature at level 15, and another feature at level 20. So if you're setting out to design a subclass for a Paladin, you're going to need to cook up about four different things that this subclass gets. But there's a certain expectation about what these abilities are actually going to be that is sort of baked into the assumptions of the class as a whole. For example, every Paladin subclass gains an expanded spell list when they choose their subclass at third level. You get to choose some spells that are appropriate for the fantasy of the subclass you're creating, and that's going to be part of it. The expanded spell list feature is also used with clerics, warlocks, and now even sorcerers. So if you're designing any subclass within those categories, you want to be aware of putting in the expanded spell list. Basically, how the feature works is that this either adds spells that are always prepared or new spells that the character can choose from 
Usually it's two spells of every level from first level spells to fifth level spells. When I'm designing a class that gets an expanded spell list, I really like to do this part first because looking at all the spells really helps reinforce the theme that I'm going for. And it really is useful to go out there and be like, ah, oh, yeah, this is really neat, or what would change? And in some cases, you might put a spell on the character's spell list that really alters the whole class. And this is really true for paladins and clerics in particular because they get a lot of their distinctiveness as a subclass from their expanded spell lists. And as we're now seeing too with what they've done with sorcerers, and I think warlocks really get a lot of distinctiveness here too. So it's worth spending a lot of time on the expanded spell list. Now, paladins also gain two other features that are pretty standard through all of their subclasses, and that is a channel divinity option and an aura. These two options happen at level three and seven respectively. The channel divinity feature is baked into the core class of a paladin, and each subclass gets a variation on their channel divinity, a single option that they can use as their channel divinity option. So again, what is the theme of your class? And you do need to come up with a channel divinity. So as an example, one of the subclasses that Kelly and I have developed for Sebastian Crow's Guide to Drakenheim is the Oath of Hexes Paladin. This is a paladin that we imagine swears a sacred oath to a eldritch force, perhaps a witch or some sort of fey creature as well. And the idea that we really liked about it is it's really kind of like a paladin with a warlock patron. And so we really wanted to have an expanded spell list that grabbed a bunch of cool offerings from the warlock spell list. And we wanted to make sure that they had some sort of channel divinity that felt like a curse. And so we created their curse of hexes power as their channel divinity option to give them that kind of uniqueness here. Now at 7th level, all paladins gain an aura, and this aura almost always starts as a 10-foot aura, and then at 18th level expands to a 30-foot aura. Some of them help the party members, some of them hinder their enemies. So you really get to choose, again, the flavor of your paladin that you're creating and what the theme of this aura is. But again, using the template, we know that we need to make an aura. In the case of our Oath of Hexes Paladin, we have their Bewitching Aura. This allows them to redirect attacks between foes and friends and vice versa, and sort of mess with the um, and sort of mess with your enemies or your allies' abilities to hit or target certain creatures. And really speaks to the idea of them bending the wills of fate to their whims. Now, from here, paladins gain abilities at 15th level and 20th level. And it's worth noting that sometimes there are exceptions to this. For example, the Oath of Vengeance Paladin in the Player's Handbook doesn't actually get an aura ability at 7th level, so you can break the rules sometimes if you want to. In particular, with Paladins, many Paladin subclasses, their 20th level feature is usually some sort of like holy transformation that lasts for one minute. But that's not always the case, and for the Oath of Hexes Paladin, we wanted to have something that was really powerful and dramatic, so we did our death hex ability that augments a lower level ability, which is the channel divinity, causing that channel divinity curse that the paladin's going to apply to cause their curse target to become vulnerable to one type of damage. Damage vulnerability is a really rare feature, it's rarely used in the game, and we thought it would be super exciting for a paladin to be able to do this at 20th level. Meanwhile, at 15th level, with paladins in particular, the sky's the limit. Like, there's kind of like whatever you want to do here is going to gonna work. The 15th yeah. level feature feels like the iconic feature that's going to amplify your theme to whatever degree you want it to. For us, we did the Reversal of Fortune. With the Reversal of Fortune ability, the Oath of Hexes Paladin gets to reverse a critical hit, which means that if they get crit, they still take the damage. But now if they hit with their next attack against the target that crit them, they land an automatic critical hit. This is great for a paladin because it means if a demon is bad enough to crit you, you can unload your best divine smite oh, into yeah, them in a reversal of yeah. fortune. Yeah. So 15th level, high level ability, but I think that really brings into play the Oath of Hexes and the feeling that we yeah. want with this subclass. Now, the key thing to know when you are looking at the class templates for any of the classes 
is how the abilities layer on top of each other and how they layer on top of the base features of the class as a whole. You want to make sure that when you're designing your subclasses that your abilities are complementing each other and not stepping on the toes of other abilities. For example, if you make a class that every ability it gets is costing a bonus action or costing a reaction, you're going to overwhelm the player with options that they can't really all use at the same time. By the same token, you don't want the coolest power that you give your class, the one that really defines it and defines the fantasy, to be the last thing it gets. <laughs> A lot of people really want to feel like they're living the fantasy of the character when they choose their subclass. So oftentimes a mechanic that we love that's being presented more and more in 5th edition D&D is that the subclass will gain an iconic feature, usually one of the meteor texts, yeah. something big that amplifies and changes the way this class plays at third level or first level or whenever they get their subclass. And then sometimes later abilities will amplify, add to, or change the way that that really big ability works, adding different options to mm -hmm. it or bolstering the power of it. This is a great design principle for subclasses. Think of things like the Rune Knight Fighter or the Battlemaster or the Eldritch Knight. These subclasses wouldn't work if you didn't get the Battlemaster maneuvers at level 3, or you didn't get the runes at level 3, or you didn't get the spell casting at level 3. It's really important that the thing that makes the fantasy tick is found right away in some of those earlier abilities. That doesn't mean that the strongest ability happens at third level. You want to think about what happens if someone multiclasses your subclass after all. But the one that really fulfills the image the icon, the action that you see this class doing should come online as soon as possible. Whereas the high level abilities can broaden the horizons, open up new features, and make the class do what's doing already even better. Another thing to keep in mind is that you can bend the rules a little further by adding more than one ability per level when they would gain their normal abilities. You see this in some subclasses. Some subclasses will gain an ability at third level, some will gain two, some might even gain three, although that's pushing it a bit. What I usually recommend, and the way that this usually works in our experience, is that sometimes you have an idea for a great feature that really drives home the flavor and theme of your subclass. But when you get to writing it and you look at the mechanics, you say, well, that's a really cool feature that I want to be here, but it's only useful in very, very specific circumstances, or it feels more like something to add to role play, or maybe one of the other pillars of play like exploration or social encounters, but it doesn't really amplify things too far. Still an iconic feature, but usually we call these a ribbon feature. Mm -hmm. A ribbon feature meaning that it's like the bow on a present. It's nice, it's beautiful, it looks good, but really you're after the gift that's inside the box, not the beautiful wrapping in the ribbon. Usually that's a good time to pair this with a secondary feature that has some sort of big mechanical benefit. One of the Warlock subclasses that we created is the Cosmic Warlock, and they draw their powers from entities from the stars and space. Because of this, when they choose their subclass, there's a list of iconic options to present the way that their body changes based on being tied to a cosmic entity. They might have constellations glowing on their body, or their eyes glow with starlight, or they speak in an echoing chorus of voices. This is great and really drives home the theme and fantasy of being a cosmic warlock, but none of these abilities have a mechanical input into the way that it plays at the table. So naturally, at the same level, they gain another iconic feature that grants them some more mechanical bonuses and useful options for the table. When I'm designing a subclass, I like to consider the three pillars of play, exploration, combat, and social interaction, and make sure that the subclass is touching on at least each of those pillars somewhere in its overall progression. Now, sometimes you can get away with that with just the expanded spell lists. In a lot of cases, the spells will do the heavy lifting for you, especially for the expanded spell list ca character classes. But in other cases, like when you're dealing with classes like the Rogue or the Barbarian or the Fighter, 
you really need to make sure that you're providing a little bit of non-combat utility through these subclasses because oftentimes, and especially in the case of the Barbarian and the Fighter, you don't get a lot of non-combat utility from the base class and they rely on the subclass providing those things. Sometimes it can really just be as simple as giving the character proficiency and a couple extra skills, maybe giving them a new saving throw proficiency, or giving them some sort of cool ability that maybe draws inspiration from how the Paladin's Divine Sense works, or how the Ranger's favorite terrain works. Just giving them a set of abilities that give them advantages under certain niche circumstances that reinforce the flavor of the subclasses as a whole. It is a bit of a judgment call. I like to make sure that every subclass I make is giving combat benefits because there is a mechanical focus to D&D in that respect. You want to make sure that you're not that if you are making a role playing heavy subclass that you are still anchoring that with something that it can actually contribute with. And as you're starting to build out these abilities and look at your templates and all of that, we come back, I think, to stepping on the toes of other classes. But I think it's important to note that a lot of times you can look to other classes' mechanics that they gain at certain levels and use those to imply or inspire mm. what sort of things a class should be gaining at a certain level. If you design a level 6 feature for your subclass and then you look at all the other subclasses that gain features at level 6 from any class and you realize that yours is much stronger than any of them, then it's probably time to dial that down or switch that to a higher level. Using what's already out there and what's already presented to help gauge what the abilities that you're gaining are is actually really instrumental and a great tool to use. For example, if you're looking at the monk and you like the way that their key points work and you like the idea of a class or subclass gaining points that they can then spend on cool abilities, you could take the key ability feature change the name of it so that it fits your theme and adapt something very similar into your subclass. You might look at that and say, well, now that's stepping on the toes of the monk. But if you're changing the theme, you have different abilities and different ways that this character, maybe not a monk at all, is going to play at the table, then you're not really stepping on the toes of that. You're just borrowing a cool idea and using already existing ideas and mechanics that people will have an easier time understanding and using that in the game. Now, when it comes to balancing the mechanics that you create, a really decent rule of thumb is to just look at what spells of each level do compared to those abilities and do your research and compare and contrast what your subclass grants and what other subclasses grant. For example, if you're giving a player character the ability to raise the dead, you probably want to make sure that that's an ability that comes online somewhere around 7th level, which when spells like Revivify and Raise Dead start to come online. Whereas if you want a, a player character to be able to do something like Turn Invisible, well that's something that could actually happen pretty early because invisibility is only a 2nd level spell. On the flip side, if you want the characters to be able to travel to other planes of existence or teleport across the end of the world, that's probably a higher level feature that a, character, a subclass shouldn't get until 15th level. Another important way to balance subclass features is to really think about what actions they require to activate and how often they can be used. Abilities don't have to be always on. They might require a character to use an action or a bonus action to activate them, and they might be limited in the number of times a character can use it. For example, limited to only being used a number of times per day equal to the character's proficiency bonus or their ability score modifier or even just a fixed, you can only use this once per day. I find, however, that you need to do some playtesting to figure out what the right balance is with these things because it can be sometimes difficult to change. So when I'm developing the abilities, I like to leave a little bit of a placeholder in my draft that says this ability needs to be limited to a number of times per day, but I'm only going to figure out how often that is through playtesting. I think that one of the benefits that Monty and I have when we're developing subclasses is before you even get to playtesting, it's sharing the idea with people that you trust, respect, and who are also good D&D players mm -hmm. who might want to look and be able to give you proper feedback. Monty and I have a great feedback loop where every time that we make a subclass, we pass it off to each other, we fix each other's subclasses up, pass them back, and we look over the notes. Yeah. And this way we kind of have a back and forth through the entire subclass process so that everything kind of gets a little bit of balancing before we even put it on the table. 
And the benefit is because we work as a pair, we can put it on the table really, really easily because one of us can simply be the player, one of us can be the DM, and because we're trying to test, it's no problem if I run a couple monsters and you run four different characters, that's fine. We're still getting the idea of how things play in combat, but we're getting that back and forth at least so you aren't trying to simulate your own combat in your head. Having one other person that you can do a combat simulation with or an adventure simulation with really, really helps the process because you can actually see how it works in play. You can start rolling dice. You can start doing things like building a character sheet together, leveling the character up, trying all these things. And all these are elements of the play testing. And really, the essence of it, the bulk of the work, and the hard part of designing a subclass is playtesting. Because ultimately, there's a lot of different character abilities, there's a lot of potential abilities that might be interesting, but you can't really tell if they're going to be good or not on the page. And I think that it's important to note with this that when you are designing your homebrew subclass, don't plop it in front of your players and say, so-and-so at my table is going to be playing this subclass in our long-term campaign that we've been playing for a year and now they're switching to this subclass and we're going to continue playing for the next year. Instead of dropping your homebrew idea directly into your long-term campaign, tell the people that you're playing with, hey, we're going to take a quick break. I've made some new subclasses. We're going to do a quick one or two shot where we just go through a quick adventure. We might do the first chapter at level three and the second chapter at level 10, just to get a feel of what low level and high level feel like with this character. And everybody plays your new subclasses that you've designed. That way you can find the mistakes, you can find the problems, you can tweak things. And then when you feel like it's ready, then you can give your players the option to pick up this new subclass and bring it into your long-term campaign. Maybe it's something inspired by your homebrew world, and so it's going to be really fitting in your campaign, but you definitely want to make sure to give it the breathing room mm -hmm. and the chance to not impact your game negatively by maybe giving it a one or two shot breathing room just, just to play around yeah. and see what works and what doesn't. And it's really important to get feedback from other members of the community and share. There's so many great community forums from our patron discord uh, to even the comments of our YouTube videos. Uh, all sorts of places where you can share your work and get feedback on it. My only thought on this is be careful of armchair feedback. It's very easy to someone for someone to tell you what's wrong with your subclass and what's wrong with your homebrew um, by reading it on the page. But there's once again, sometimes you need to see it in play to actually make that determination properly. Things like what the damage die bonus, like if you're if you've got a, an ability that gives bonus damage. You might need to tweak that through playtesting a couple times around. If you've got an ability that's limited in use, but you're trying to figure out exactly how many times, you might need to playtest this. Playtesting can be a big challenge though, because a D&D campaign that goes from level one to 20 is a big commitment. Are you going to playtest your new subclass in a complete campaign from level one to 20? Because that's gonna take you a really long time to playtest it and you're gonna have to gather a lot of data to actually work that out. Does that mean that you're gonna run multiple encounters of every level over and over again? Are you going to make sure that you've fought every creature type, every monster type, every possible scenario? It can be a lot of work. My recommendation would be to look at when the subclass gains their abilities and maybe running a one-shot at each of the levels where they gain their abilities. You may want to present certain combat or social or exploration encounters that amplify or allow the player to use those abilities. And in that regard, you could shorten it even more by choosing level 3 when they gain their subclass, level 5, 10, 15, and 20, or you could even do just like 3, 10, 20, and allow them to run through a few different scenarios, mm -hmm. again, where they get to use multiple of their abilities, multiple of their spells and features. And really just giving the subclass a chance to show off each ability a few times in different ways might be all you need to feel satisfied with your playtesting. I would definitely say they'll focus your playtesting on under level 10. <laughs> I think that most of D&D happens under level 10 for many campaigns and players, and that's a really important part in the subclass developing its identity. Past around level 13 or so, 
the balance of Dungeons and Dragons kind of goes out the window anyways. So I feel like the ROI on high level playtesting in D&D 5e is pretty low. And you're not going to fix the balance issues of high level D&D with your new subclass. It's already kind of broken. And so it shouldn't be your objective to try to fix that with your subclass because you can't like it's a bigger issue than what one subclass or even one homebrew class can can achieve so in my books it's better to focus on the lower level play and yeah you don't want anything that's like obviously game breaking as a high level ability like an ability that says the dm instantly destroys the world or this character is now completely unkillable you want to watch out for that stuff but it's really hard to assess like how powerful is too powerful at high levels so I think it's more important to play test between level 3 and maybe 11, with probably the lion's share of the playtesting should happen between level 3 and 8. I love putting a really ridiculous ability at level 20 yeah. that makes people read it and go, oh man, this subclass is cool. They're probably never going to yeah. use that ability, or if they do, they're going to use it in the final encounter of their mm -hmm. campaign. But it, it helps really drive home how cool yeah. the subclass could be yeah. if you play it all the way. That might be a bit of a pragmatic hot take of don't worry about the balance at high level play. And you're, again, ultimately your mileage may vary. I, I would just say that the high level play testing is a very hit and miss experience in my books. Um, it, it's really hard to tell. And it's one of those things too where it can just get thrown out the window by the other characters that are part of the playtest because if you are playtesting your homebrew subclass, you gotta have a party, you gotta have monsters. There's so many, there's so many variables. And that's where for us, developing subclasses with the benefit of having a amazing community out there that can try things out and give us feedback that we can collect a community can do more playtesting in a month than you can probably do ever. <laughs> and that's where I think you need to be open to sharing your homebrew subclass with your friends, maybe your table. If you know a few other tables that are also playing D&D and you trust them and you like them, you could give your subclass to them and ask them to try it out as yeah. well. The more eyes that you have on your subclass, the more likely you are to catch any flaws or issues. Mm -hmm. This is especially important if you're planning on publishing your subclass or putting it on the DMs Guild or, or anywhere else. If you're just playing at home with your friends, then you can really be the judge of whether it's working for you as mm -hmm. the DM or not. Or if you're presenting it to a DM as a homebrew subclass, as long as everybody at the table is having a good time, you're fine. But as you get into are you sharing this with a lot of people, you want to make sure that you're hitting the right notes, bringing to life a new fantasy, and really making something unique, fun, and exciting, and balanced at the table. You're never going to hit the balance on the first pass. So even if you are just homebrewing something for your own group that's just going to be used by your immediate friends, it's worth having an, a friendly agreement that if you run into something that's problematic that you have an agreement that, oh, yeah, it turns out your character can never die. Or it turns out your character can do 500 million points of damage in one attack. Obviously, you should revise it and fix it. And so if you are going to be using playtest material or developmental material or homebrew material, having that kind of expectation of like, yeah, we're figuring this out. We're going to have some fun with it. And if something goes off the rails, we'll address it as need be. Designing your own subclasses is probably our favorite homebrewing that you can do. It has its challenges, it's a lot harder than making a magic item or a spell, but it can be really rewarding, especially if you've been playing D&D for a while and you have all sorts of these fantasies and ideas of ways that you could bring characters to life that you just can't seem to nail in the existing options. If you're that person who's feeling that way, who reflavoring has gotten you so far, but you just wish your barbarian could pick up a goblin and use it as a club, yeah. then you sit down and you say, let's make a barbarian subclass where I can use a goblin as a club. And you do it, and you have fun with it. And if you're having fun, and all the players at your table are having fun, then there's no harm in, in bringing to life your favorite fantasies in D&D. Everyone is going to develop your own method for designing new things for subclasses. It really is this weird combination of art and science, testing, iteration, and development. It takes time. Um, your first draft will not be your last draft. 
go in with that expectation that you're going to develop it, that you're going to take it a little bit further, that you're going to get feedback, and you'll have a lot of fun and enjoy that process so much. So tell us about the ideas of the homebrew subclasses you have in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. And we have a truly awesome Patreon Discord community that shares their homebrew material with each other and gives that sort of feedback that is so essential to this process. It's really an amazing space, and if you'd like to get in on that, you can follow the links in our description below to find out how you can support our channel and join our community. And don't forget to check out our live play in the Worlds of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday evenings on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we've got plenty more content about homebrewing for D&D 5e right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.